Hello all and welcome to the Independent Sage Briefing. I'm afraid the picture is rather dull. It is now the third week in a row that we are headlining the fact that COVID infections and hospitalizations are, guess what, on the rise. And although it's been well more than two years since the pandemic began, we cannot just wish it away. When we first learned of the virus in early 2020, there was much that was unknown. But since then, a lot has been researched and we have gained useful knowledge along the way. However, the myths and misinformation, not to mention the blatant attempts at disinformation we have seen from some bad actors, have nonetheless persisted and remain abundant, despite the wealth of scientific evidence pointing the other way. So today, we're going to take up some of these COVID myths and we will be addressing them head on. But before that, as ever, we have the latest COVID numbers and trends presented for us this week by Dr. Duncan Robertson. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you very much. So um, we're at the stage, as um, Goody was saying, that uh, infections are rising, uh, certainly rising in England. But uh, with the ONS survey, we're sort of three weeks out of date. So we're sort of looking into the past to see what's coming. Uh, but we can also see hospitalizations increasing and the number of patients in hospital with COVID is increasing as well. There's uh, some new data from uh, about long COVID, a change of methodology related to the way that ONS collects information. And we're really in this stage where there's no clear variant that's driving this, this wave, but there are, are a mix of, of variants. And kind of if we look at them collectively, we can perhaps see that um, there's a trend there. So in terms of um, infections, this is from the ONS survey, this representative sample of people across the countries of the United Kingdom. And we can see that, uh, you know, uh, the number of people um, who are testing positive is rising in England, that red line there, uh, rising in Northern Ireland. Um, but really, so across the country, it's about one in 50 uh, people would be testing positive uh, this is up to the 24th to 26th of September. So we're once again looking backwards to see what's coming. But uh, we're certainly at this stage where the numbers are increasing. And that's increasing across different regions of the UK. We can see relatively uh, sharp increases across uh, the country. Uh, so it's not confined to one particular part of England. Um, I think what's uh, of concern is the number of people in older age groups, particularly those over 70 that are uh, testing positive. That's gone up significantly uh, in this latest um, uh, latest release of data from the ONS, uh, which is, of course, of concern because these are the sort of patients that may well end up in hospital. And we can see that in the figures here. So if you look at the bottom chart there, you can see uh, the number of people testing positive is one in 40 amongst over 70s in England. Uh, and that the trend there seems to be upwards, which is of concern. So how does that reflect in, ter in terms of hospitalizations? Uh, so this is the number of people who are admitted to hospital. Um, and you can see that's very much uh, on the rise there. And this is, um, of course, putting pressure on the hospital system when uh, it, it has uh, other pressures. And of course, we're you know, not in winter at the moment. We're kind of going into autumn. Uh, so this is really of concern. And in terms of who's going in, it's very much driven by the over 65s. Um, and this is the, the rate of increase there, but it's also increasing in under 65. So these are the people who are admitted to hospital. Uh, it's going up across the country. Um, in London, perhaps uh, less than other places uh, in, in England, but you can see relatively high increases everywhere else. And some of these are kind of have, have uh, younger populations, for example, but you can see a range of increases across the country. Um, in terms of uh, ages, uh, it's very much, as I say, driven by these uh, older people, um, but we can see every age group is increasing in terms of number of people who are admitted. Now, as well as people being admitted, the pressure is the number of people who are actually in hospital. So you've got people coming into hospital, that's increasing, but you've also got the number of people in hospital is increasing, and that's increasing uh, pretty rapidly at the moment, which is, of course, putting pressure on the hospital system. This is across the entire pandemic. So we can see we've had the waves, um, you know, in, in, in 2022, 
And, you know, the trend is certainly that we're having another wave at the moment. This is patients in hospital. So, of course, that's an, that puts uh, pressure on the day to day activities and perhaps means you can't do as much of the other things you want to be doing within hospitals. This is splitting it between uh, the primary diagnosis in terms of whether you're in primarily because of COVID or whether it's a, um, uh, an additional uh, diagnosis. So we can see if you look at the red line at the bottom, that's certainly increasing. So it's not just because of the prevalence in the community. These are people who are going into hospital primarily because they have COVID in that red line, which of course is an issue. And I think the other thing to, to say is it's also putting pressure on mechanically ventilated beds. Um, so these are the, the patients who are perhaps uh, very ill. Uh, that's also increasing. So it's not just admissions, it's also uh, mechanically ventilated beds as well are increasing. This is a slide from uh, Tom Lawton, who's looking at the percentage of hospital acquired infections. Uh, so these are probably or definitely acquired in hospital. So some of that is driven just by community prevalence of, of COVID, but there is certainly an amount of COVID that is being caught um, in hospitals. Uh, which is uh, increasing. In terms of vaccinations, we're in the autumn vaccination programme. We're still really on the over 65s. Um, and so for over 75s, roughly half of those eligible have uh, come forward for their autumn vaccination, which is very good. And around a third of 65 to 74 year olds have come forward. Um, this will be going down to 50 plus in, in the years ahead, uh, sorry, in the months or weeks ahead, not quite sure when, but you know, that there is at least um, you know, good take up. It could be better for, um, for, for vaccinations, these booster vaccinations. And of course, with the number of people having COVID increasing, it's very important that people come forward for that booster vaccination when they are called, when they're eligible. Uh, looking at the people um, in these most um, in these older age groups, you can see that they they're split down. The the light, the brown there is the autumn twenty two booster, and so really you know the protection is ramping up the more of these boosters people have. So it's good to see um, there are people coming forward, but of course that could be increased and that brown line could come down. So. Um, uh, bringing people forward to vaccination is important, and this is especially true amongst um, uh, different ethnic groups. So it's uh, very important that with the uh, reduction in the amount of uh, um, advertising uh, that's, that's being done for these boosters, um, it's important that everyone comes forward um, from all communities. So long COVID, uh, ONS has changed their methodology um, so with the uh, ONS uh, COVID infection survey, um, it's now, uh, the, these are all 100% online responses. So you can't really look back and compare it directly to what happened uh, with the long COVID statistics before. So we sort of almost have to kind of start looking forward at this new, um, new series. Um, and also the way it's reported is, is the length of time is the length of time from your first infection. So it may be that actually you're reporting, self-reporting these long COVID symptoms, but that's from a reinfection. So some, it can be quite difficult to interpret some of these. And these are experimental statistics from the ONS. But we can see that uh, in terms of people who self-report um, having low, long COVID symptoms, um, uh, most of them are uh, a little or not affected, but we still have around 15% of those reporting those uh, symptoms who, uh, for whom it uh, has a significant or a lot of an impact on their day-to-day -day lives. And in terms of who's reporting these, you get up to one in 20 people in those sort of middle-aged age groups who are reporting long COVID symptoms, uh, which last more than four weeks. So, you know, a significant number of people are self-reporting uh, these symptoms, which is, of course, a concern. Uh, and if you look at the number of people who've had symptoms for this amount of time, it adds up to roughly 2.3 million people who are reporting uh, long COVID symptoms, which of course is a, a significant number of people and this has effects on um, the working population. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a concern. Um, and, you know, with all these things, there is a, a, a link between deprivation, how uh, deprived people are, the index of multiple deprivation, and how many people are reporting long COVID. So you know, we can see these health inequalities 
happening, uh, including in long COVID. And in terms of variants, where are we? Um, so in the previous waves, it's been very clear that there have been certain variants that have been driving those, uh, those waves, BA1, BA2, BA5, 4 and 5. Um, but now we're seeing there's there's more of a mix. There isn't a clear variant that's um, that's dominating. It may happen in the future, but certainly for the moment, there is this kind of soup of Omicron variants um, which are competing against each other. Um, this is a, a slide from Tom uh, Wensleyers, uh, who's looking at the growth rate of different uh, different variants. And you can see this is the kind of Omicron soup we have at the moment. Uh, BQ.1.1 um, is potentially has that highest potential growth advantage, um, it's only BQ1, but we will see in the weeks ahead which or which multiples of those variants uh, becomes dominant in the UK. And, you know, rather than looking at individual variants, you can look at ones that have certain characteristics. And if you lump them together, you can see there's a, there's a growth um, there with about one in 11 having um, you know, these sequences, um, the, these variants, if you classify them together. So these are all subvariants of Omicron, so they're all, they haven't been named as, as new variants of concern so far, but they may well be in the near future. So there we are, infections are rising, particularly in England. Uh, we're looking back at the data, so it's out of date, but we can see the more recent data in terms of hospitalizations and patients in hospital is increasing. There's this new data from, uh, from ONS about long COVID, particularly new methodology, and we're very much in this Omicron variant soup. There's no clear variant, um, but there are certainly lots coming um, that may cause concern in the future. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Duncan. Um, we're going to now move on to our main session and today's topic, which, as I previously mentioned, is on COVID-associated myths and misinformation. So whether it's the notion that COVID is like a cold or that long COVID is all in the mind, we know that the myths are many. But where do they stand and what's the truth? To kick off this session, I would like to invite Professor, Professor Trish Greenhard. Over to you, Trish. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Giddy. And uh, yes, welcome to Dangerous Myths About COVID-19. Where's the truth? Uh, as Goody said, we're, we're approaching the end of the third year of the pandemic, and it's amazing how many people are still completely confused about what the key facts are. And it's partly uh, because of these myths that are circulating on social media, in the newspapers, on television, the radio. Sometimes they're innocent stories that have just got out of hand, the misinformation, and other times we suspect that those myths have been deliberately put there to deceive us. That's what we call disinformation. So let's have a look at some of those myths. And I think we might as well start um, with, we'll start with a few that are all, all in the same kind of vein of, well, it's not very serious, it's all over anyway. Uh, so let's pick on this one, it's just a cold. Can I ask Steve Griffin to uh, tell us, is it just a cold, Steve? Um, thanks, Trish. Well, I think <laughs> that's, that's a, a very broadly accepted um, trope at the moment, and it's quite worrying because people need to understand that what makes a cold just a cold is that those viruses that cause those things are in balance with our immunity, the inherent virulence and, and changeability of that virus, and of course our environment, whether we're taking lots of different drugs that might affect our immune responses. So the reason a cold is a cold for most of us is that our immunity is stable and very effective as a population. The virus doesn't change very much and isn't inherently dangerous as such, but that's simply not the case with SARS-CoV-2. That, that virus is changing as we've just seen with all the variant soups, it has inherent um, virulence in there that, that makes it a very dangerous virus indeed um, in certain circumstances. And of course, our immunity, whilst we are boosting and vaccinating, is very good at the moment, but it's also changing and, and isn't keeping to, um, pace with, with the virus as it changes. That as well as this virus is the, the fair comparison would be a pandemic influenza, but we don't have one of those, thankfully. It also isn't just a respiratory virus. It seems to affect our vascular chair and, of course, long covid is a major problem, which seems to be a much more complicated, common and diverse problem compared with most other post-viral syndromes. So no, it's not a cold. We're here by virtue of attaining balance. Oh, uh, it doesn't sound like a cold. Uh, Christine, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you can just look at the death data. If you look at um, 
cause of death on death certificates. We've had over 40,000 deaths just this year with COVID on the death certificate. And that's in but an that doesn't of... sound like a cold either, does it? Um, no, in fact, it's forest. double than average flu season. So, yeah, definitely not. So let me just come back to another myth. Um, well, which is that, well, it's it's not right, not just a cold in adults, particularly older adults, but, you know, in children, uh, they always get it mildly, don't they? Isn't it just a cold in children? Sheena, can I ask you to comment specifically on kids? Well, it, it, in, in the first wave in particular, we did see that COVID was milder for some children, but that doesn't mean that all children do have the same experience. And um, we've seen that this has been getting higher and higher with each concurrent wave. So the risk of this happening is much higher the more cases there are. And in 2020 in England, there were over 3,000 hospitalizations in under 18s for COVID. This rose to over 16,000 so far in 2022. So this is not a trivial thing. And unfortunately, this is also being seen in numbers of deaths. We have seen um, over 100 deaths to date. Now, that is more than any other childhood disease that we would routinely vaccinate for. So that just gives you a scale as to how serious it is. It's not just death and hospitalizations. We have at least 105,000 children and young people who have long COVID. And 22,000 of those children have had those symptoms for more than a year and a staggering 18,000 children and young adults are reporting that their activities are being limited a lot. So you can imagine this is affecting their daily lives, it's affecting their education, it's having a huge impact. Great, thanks uh, very much. Doesn't sound like it's just a cold in some children, um, even if it's mild in many children. Thanks very much for that. Now for another commonly held myth that the these deaths associated with COVID People uh, with COVID who die aren't actually dying of COVID. They're just dying with COVID. In other words, they would have died anyway. Helen, can you help us with that one? Yes, certainly. I mean, it's trivially true that we're all going to die anyway of something. But um, specifically when it comes to death certificates, um, we know that lots of deaths come from a combination of things. Some people have one thing and that's the only thing. They were perfectly healthy. They get something. That's what kills them. But lots of people, they die in older age and there's several things going on. So death certificates don't just have one thing on them. They actually pick up all this data. So, for example, if someone's being treated for cancer um, and then they get COVID and die, both the cancer and the COVID will appear on the death certificate. And we don't know how many more years of life they would have had or how successful their cancer treatment might have been if they hadn't had COVID. So there's lots of unknowns there. But very significantly, it doesn't appear on the death certificate unless the doctor filling that certificate in thinks it is it contributed to the death. So the only things that are on the death certificate are things that contributed to the death of that person. We don't always know exactly how much they contributed, but they're not just with. So if you happen to have COVID with 28 days previously, it really didn't affect you very much, but then you went in with something else. It's not gonna appear on the death certificate, only on the certificate if we think it contributed to the death. And unfortunately, there have been a large number of those. Absolutely, okay, thanks very much for that, Helen. Now let's move on to one more myth about COVID being mild, which is the idea that long COVID either doesn't exist at all or that it's all in the mind. Uh, and I've got a view on that one myself. As things stand currently, and this may change, there isn't one specific single blood test or X-ray or any other kind of test that will say for sure that someone has long COVID. And we don't know why some people get it and others don't. But this doesn't mean that the person is imagining 
that they've got long COVID. It is a real condition. It's caused by underlying virus-induced changes. Now, there's been an awful lot of research on long COVID uh, and various different research studies have shown different kinds of changes. Changes in the immune system, for example, changes in hormone levels, particularly cortisol levels, microclotting in the blood vessels uh, and changes, for example, uh, that you might see in the brain if you do an MRI scan. Now, the, all of these different changes have been shown in some but not all people with long COVID, and that suggests that more than one pathway is probably involved. So there's a lot of ongoing research which is trying to tease out these various underlying pathways that are linking persistence of the virus to persistence of symptoms. So plenty of research, plenty of real physical detectable findings, but not yet a fully coherent story of what exactly is going on at, at the micro level. Uh, so I can say uh, this myth uh, that COVID's all in the mind uh, is just that, it's a myth. So now let's uh, go on uh, and look at a different set of myths. Uh, and these, this next set of myths have the general format the prevention, the preventive measures were worse than the disease. And I want to start with lockdown. There's a big myth going around that lockdowns weren't really very effective. And what's more, they did damage, for example, by affecting people's mental health. People often cite Sweden as a country which didn't lock down or didn't lock down very much uh, and did pretty well anyway. So I'm going to hand back to you, Christina, to kick off on this question of lockdown. Were they a bad idea? Sorry, I had to find my mute button. Um, well, I think for start, Sweden may not have had a national lockdown, but it did have plenty of restrictions. Other countries never had national lockdowns, Japan, South Korea, other East Asian countries, but they all had various public health measures. And you don't need a lockdown if you have other excellent public health mitigations, most notably a really good testing, tracing, contact tracing, isolating and support system which many East Asian countries did have, or in a focus on ventilation or a focus on public health messaging around crowds, which Japan had. Now, Sweden didn't get away with it. It's had more than twice the deaths of population of its neighbours in Norway and Finland. Japan and South Korea have had very low death rates, community, far lower than any European country. So, so firstly, it's not the case that other countries did nothing. Lockdowns work, right? They suppress infection. We've seen it time and time again across the world. They're even working now in China against Omicron, but they are harmful, right? There's no doubt about that. And we could have in England, and we should have avoided them, especially after the first one, if we had put in really effective and ubiquitous and supportive public health measures. We didn't do it, and that was on us. Thank you very much, Christina. Now, we, I think we've got Martin McKee here. Have you got anything you to do. add there? You do. So just to echo what uh, Christina said, the, the key issue with a lockdown or what other measure you might uh, introduce is to stop people mixing together and therefore spreading infection. So uh, you've already mentioned Korea. So I was working with Korean colleagues and in fact, colleagues from across the OECD countries. And we looked at the changes in mobility measured by mobile phone data, the Google tracking data. And we were able to show that in 34 OECD countries, plus Taiwan and Singapore, once you reduce more mobility down by about 40%, then you had a substantial reduction in transmission of COVID. Uh, we were able to look at different types of mobility, but we focused particularly on commuting, which brings together the workplace, transit stations and retail. And then another study in the United Kingdom by Lee and colleagues looked at 330 UK local authorities and found essentially the same result. And then bringing it more up to date, Harris in a study in BMC infectious diseases looked at 111 US cities during the Omicron wave and found exactly the same, find that a 1% reduction in mobility I was associated with a 0.6% decline in the peak of the Omicron wave. But the key point is to have mitigations in place. And we had a paper in the British Medical Journal back in April 2020 saying that we had to restrict the transmission. We also had to put in place measures which would protect people from the consequences of all of that. <clears throat> and the key thing is to have a balanced portfolio of, of measures so that you're stopping transition but <clears throat> protecting people. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, 
I'm going to move on to the next myth because I'm trying to get as many of these myths in in the time slot as possible. So the next myth is that vaccines are worse than the disease. Uh, and I wonder if I can invite Sheena to come along and comment. Are the vaccines worse than the disease, Sheena? Well, we know the vaccines are very safe. So today, around 12.7 billion doses of COVID vaccines have been administered across 184 countries. Now, during the Omicron era, vaccination and a booster was shown to reduce the chance of hospitalisation and death by over 90%. And in early 2021, Israel was about the first country to show that vaccines were bending the kind of curve of COVID infections in terms of seriousness and hospitalizations and deaths. And then this country's led the world in early vaccinations with cases declining rapidly. And we've seen this sort of pattern of vaccination and recovery across dozens of countries with dozens and dozens of studies since. In terms of the current vaccines that we have in the UK, these are either the original vaccines or the new bivalent vaccine that contains information about both the original strain and the Omicron strain. And this has also been tested very well in phase two to three studies for efficacy and safety before it was rolled out in the UK. And that was in human volunteers. Thanks very much, uh, Sheena. Now, um, Steve, have you got anything to add on that, particularly around fertility? There seems to be a myth that vaccines reduce your fertility. No, that's, that's absolutely right, Trish. And I think this, this definitely falls into the disinformation category because it was something that was, if not started, at least um, very much propagated by someone called Michael Yeadon. And um, what Yeadon said was that when you immunise someone with a spike vaccine, then you also immunise um, people against a protein that's made in the placenta and this was, um, you know, obviously very worrying to young couples and, and things like that, but it was incredibly scientifically flawed. But unfortunately, it's so insidious that it's permeated across social media and everywhere else. But we know just from schoolboy immunology or school person immunology that this cannot be the case because for starters, all of this, the, the white blood cells that would recognize those proteins are deleted at birth. And second, the region of overlap that Eden said there was between spike and this protein in the placenta was too small so that it would never ever be recognized by our immune systems. But unfortunately, this has taken on a bit of a MMRS kind of um, grotesqueness and it is really, really um, a widespread myth that really needs to be, to be stopped in my view. Yeah, and can I, I just sort of add from wearing my GP hat that if there's a couple who are interested in, or even an individual who's interested in having a, a baby soon, it's very important to get your immunizations up to date because what you don't want is to catch COVID when you're pregnant. No, absolutely. Okay, um, anyone want to comment on boosters? Because there's another myth that boosters, uh, are, you know, the, the vaccine, all right, we'll accept the vaccine, but the, but the boosters all know they're a bit new, they haven't been properly tested and they're not really very effective. Who, who would like to comment on that one? You're slow on the buttons, I should have prepared someone. Do you want to have I a go, Sheena? I, I want, yeah, I can talk about that, but I wanted to just add a little bit to the thing about fertility. So we yep. now know that there's been trials on um, to address this. So, for example, in the original um, vaccine trials, we saw people get pregnant naturally and at the same degree frequency as people on the placebo arm. There was a study earlier this year of around 2,000 couples in the USA and showed that they were just as likely to get pregnant. In fact... Um, there's also been studies looking at ovarian reserves in females before and after vaccination, and we know there's no impact. But infection with SARS-CoV-2 is actually associated with a short-term um, reduction in fertility in males. So it can actually have a bit of a detrimental effect in males. So the disease itself might make you temporarily infertile, but the vaccine you're a man. doesn't. Yes. If you're a man, absolutely. Um, uh, and just can you fill us in on the booster question, Gina, while you're, while you're there? So the question was around whether the boosters have been tested and whether they're effective. Um, so they have been tested um, and the, the, the clinical trials have been performed and we can see at least a two or more full protection um, rate to Omicron and other strains of COVID. 
Now, um, that is even more magnified when you think about the fact that everybody's infection um, and antibody levels have dropped massively since they were last boosted. So we can see that people who are not vaccinated are much more vulnerable to infection. Great. Thanks very much. So, so that's a, a, a quick trot through all the myths or some of the myths about vaccines. And now I'm going to return to another subject that's dear to my own heart, masks. Here's the myth that there's no robust evidence that masks work. And that's been going around for two and a half more or more years. So let's first of all unpack this word robust. What people tend to mean in this context is that there's no randomized controlled trial evidence that masks prevent infections in the wearer. Now, even that's not true, but we shouldn't conflate the word robust with randomized trials. There have been literally dozens of studies which show that if a high proportion of the population is wearing masks in indoor settings, far fewer people get infecting, infected. Masking protects you and it also protects other people from your germs. Now, as most people know by now, SARS-CoV-2 is an airborne virus. We breathe it in and out. And we do need to acknowledge that no mask is perfect at removing those little viral particles from the air. But high quality masks are now pretty good. The word, you may have heard the word N95, for example, an N95 mask. And what that means is that the mask filters out 95% of particles. An N99 mask is going to filter out 99% of particles. So it's not 100%, but it's pretty good. Of course, the mask has to fit you and you have to be wearing it. It doesn't work if it's in your pocket. It doesn't work if it's back at home in a drawer. But if you put it on and keep it on, it will work. Another myth about masks is that they cause harm. Now look, masks don't kill you, even though people say they do. Masks don't lower your blood oxygen levels. I've actually done a randomized controlled trial on that one myself. We got medical students to wear them and run around the track and we measured their oxygen levels. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be published soon, but it showed that even when you're running around the track, your oxygen levels don't go down. Um, masks don't weaken your immune system. That's another, another myth. They do not cause major mental trauma in children, though it's certainly true that some kids don't want to wear them, and I'd never force a child to wear a mask. It's also true that if someone's claustrophobic, the mask can make them feel panicky. Some masks, particularly those very thick cloth masks, can make it hard to understand someone's speech. And that's particularly a problem for people who've got hearing difficulties who lip read. And we do need to take seriously the needs of people who communicate by lip reading, but that doesn't mean we should fall for the myth that masks are ineffective or that they cause a whole host of other harms. Okay, so that's myths about masks. And just very briefly, talking of viruses in the air, there's a new myth going around that improving the quality of air by ventilation or filtration in buildings uh, either isn't important or it's too expensive or it doesn't have a strong evidence base. I've even heard rumours that overfiltration of air could cause harm. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail here, but there's plenty of evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is airborne and that a very effective way of reducing transmission is attending to the quality of indoor air. There's nothing bad about fresh air. And in terms of air quality, you simply can't overventilate or overfilter. Uh, I wondered if Duncan wanted to have a, a, a comment on this. Uh, I think you've got um, a report that you might want to mention here, Duncan. Well, that's right. The Royal Academy of Engineering uh, produced a report in, in June where um, it's really kind of making the case for, for ventilation and, and clean air. So I suppose there's sort of an analogy you can make about, you know, do you want clean water? Should you have clean water or can you have water that's too clean? And so, of course, you know, you reduce cholera and typhoid by having clean water and you reduce the uh, transmission of respiratory diseases by having clean air. And of course, this is for COVID and for potentially other respiratory diseases that come in the future. Absolutely. OK, thanks very much for that, Duncan. So let's move on to something else. Another myth that I hear quite frequently is that, look, it's either a full on lockdown and all those restrictions or taking no precautions whatsoever. I want to get a psychologist view on this one. Um, we've got Susan Mickey, I think, on. Susan, can you talk us through this? Sure, Trish. Trish. Um, so 
we've already heard about a lot of different things that can be done to reduce COVID transmission. And the key things are not having people crowded together in indoor spaces with inadequate quality of air. Um, and there's lots of ways of doing that. But the key thing is to ensure high quality air. And in, 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 there's a 1992 health, safety and welfare legislation, which is to do with the workplace, which means that employers do have a duty to ensure that people have um, clean air. So this is a really important thing um, that can be done. And where we don't have ventilated or filtrated air, then those are the circumstances where, as has been described, wearing high quality masks is really helpful. And so, what we're trying to yeah. do here is keep people at work, keep children at school and keep people well. But then you have to say, we have all these things. Often people call it the, the vaccine plus strategy because vaccine was a game changer um, you know, when, when it came along, but it's not sufficient. We need these other measures too. But why aren't they being put in place? That's a big question. And why aren't people clamoring and campaigning to have these put in place? Well, one thing is, we obviously know we have a government that doesn't appear to really care about this or be committed um, to, to, to making these environments safe for everyone. But the other thing is that I think people have kind of been influenced by this government strategy of basically pretending it doesn't exist and not talking about it and just thinking, well, does it really exist? Maybe it's going away. And people you know, have a tendency, and this is seen over quite a lot of areas, very good research studies showing it, that if people are confronted with a threat where they think there's nothing can be done about it, then they tend to minimize that threat because otherwise it makes them incredibly anxious. And you minimize that threat in many different ways, you know, by saying, well, there's not much of it around, or maybe if it is around, but it's getting milder, or, well, it won't really affect me, or, you know, whatever it might be. And the, the best way of, of helping with this is firstly doing what we're doing today and giving people the information so they can have informed choices about how they manage their risk and the risk of other people, but also showing the ways in which individuals, families, communities, organizations, workplaces, et cetera, can do something to reduce that threat. And if you give people those practical, obvious things to do, then they will be able to take on board the fact that yes, we are still in a risky situation, and yes, we do need to manage that threat, manage that risk and reduce it. So there's a lot of things going on here, but you know, in summary, there's a lot we can and should be doing. And what we want to do is kind of enable and empower people to say, it still is worth doing all these things. We can make a big difference, you know, but we also need to campaign to have the government, employers, et cetera, do their bit. We all need to be in this together. That's great. Thanks, Susan. And I think we've got time for one more uh, myth. And I'm going to ask Anthony to comment on this one, which is the myth. Well, COVID's never going to go away now. So why don't we just give in to it? Um, we might as well just lie down and let it wash over us. Anthony, what have you got to say on that one? Thanks, Trish. Well, do we just lie down and live with measles or with TB or HIV or malaria or meningitis or pneumonia? or diarrhoea. I mean, no, we don't. Only one virus has ever been eradicated, and that was smallpox. And it's very difficult to eradicate viruses. We know COVID isn't over. Near uh, Over 400 Americans die each day from COVID at the moment. It's the second highest cause of death after cancer. We've heard the figures, you know, 200,000 British citizens have lost their lives. Uh, the long COVID today, 2 million on the ONS survey. Um, so no, medicine is about prevention and treatment of diseases that kill and maim us. And, you know, good, sensible public health must not be shouted down by libertarians. The economic impacts that we are seeing right now is partly due to the prolonged lockdowns because we didn't implement good public health measures at the very start and during the different waves. And of course, there are people who want to lift speed limits and safety belts and allow smoking in restaurants and, you know, pollute our rivers and sea. And there are the anti-vaxxers and uh, people who want to I end sugar tax. <laughs> uh, but, 
and, and, and people who want to cut taxes for the richest and cut benefits for the poorest. And that has health consequences. But I, I just say that public health is essential. It should be democratic and it always protects the most vulnerable. And Indy Sage absolutely believes in public health. Absolutely. OK, that's that's great. Um, so we're not going to give in to it, certainly not on independent sage. Goody, I'm going to hand back to you because I think you've got some questions from the public. Thanks, Trish, and thanks to the whole panel, because that was fascinating and I think underlines all of the messages that you have been telling us throughout the last two and a half years. So, yes, you're right. We're now going to move on to questions from members of the public. And actually, some of them have joined us today and they're here live to ask their questions themselves. There are other questions that I'll be asking on behalf of other people. So the first question that we have is from Nicola Thompson-Jack. Nicola, please go ahead and ask your question. Nicola, are you still there with us? There, can you hear me? Hi, yes. There. Yeah. yeah, hello. <laughs> Hi there. Thanks for having me on today. Um, my question is, is it safe to have the next booster after having shingles and still experiencing nerve pain? And is there any connection between the vaccine, COVID and shingles? Thanks. Oh, very interesting question there. Who would like to have a go at answering this one? Right, Helen Salisbury, do you want to take this? Hello, um, hi, yes, you could, some people do get really quite nasty pain that goes on a long time after having shingles. Um, we don't know of any reason why you shouldn't have the, um, the, the COVID vaccine having had shingles. There is a, there's a suggestion that we shouldn't have the, the jab within a week of having the shingles vaccination. But other than that, no. It's quite interesting, though, I have heard anecdotally, but I haven't seen any research on the fact that there, there seems to be a bit of a relationship between COVID and shingles and quite a lot of younger people. Who, and usually, usually um, shingles more affects older people than younger. Um, and there, there's possibly a bit more shingles in younger people happening after having had the COVID illness. I haven't actually seen any statistics, but that's what I'm hearing anecdotally, which is interesting. So the question of, of what does COVID itself do to your immunity? Because of course, shingles is about the reactivation of a virus you already, already have, the chickenpox virus. But as far as I'm aware, the vaccine should be beneficial rather than causing you any harm in this situation. Thank you, Helen. Um, Professor Sheena Crookshank, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to add, shingles generally occurs, it, you know, it's reactivation of chickenpox virus, and it stays latent in your body, and it generally occurs when you're a bit run down. Um, so I think what we're seeing is, is symptomatic of people being run down, and I'm one of the unlucky people who actually had shingles in my 20s. <laughs> Um, so um, you can get shingles at any age. And I didn't believe I had it. And the, the GP just thought I had wonderful shingles rash all across, across the middle of my back. So it's symptomatic being run down. And I think that's why we might be seeing it if we are seeing it in younger people is that there are younger people who are feeling sort of the effects of having infections like COVID at the moment, because of course the younger groups are not vaccinated. Well, that's super interesting. Thank you. And Dr. C. Griffin, I think you might have something to add to this too. Yeah, um, it, it may be that there is also a specific SARS-CoV-2 element to this because there is there are some studies um, that suggest that the virus can have an effect on your adaptive immune system, which is quite important at keeping the, um, the shingles virus in check. So it's not been confirmed yet, but there does seem to be a sort of period of, of your immune system not working as well. Um, after you have SARS-CoV-2. So it could be that having COVID can lead to shingles, as, as Helen has suggested, um, but I don't think the vaccine will be a problem at all. Super interesting. Thank you, Nicola, for that really, really interesting question. I'm going to move us on now to our next member of the public, who is also here to join us. Uh, and so Paramjit Flora, do you want to ask your question now? 
Uh, yeah, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Um, so my question is really asking you to explain something to me. So could you explain a little bit more about the discovery by the Emory Vaccine Centre of a broadly neutralising antibody that could result in a variant-proof vaccine? So when I read that, it sounded really positive, but I have a really limited understanding of exactly what that means, the potential impact of that discovery, and over what sort of time frame. So some help, please. Super interesting question about the kind of forefront of uh, research right now. Dr. Steve Griffin. I found it. Um, yeah, so I don't know the exact target that they're talking about. I, there are several different things in the pipeline with this sort of idea. Um, the major problem we have with our vaccines in terms of protecting against infection is that the spike protein, or at least the regions of the spike protein on the virus, the thing that gets it into the cells, is incredibly tolerant to change, okay? It's a very complicated, very big protein, but it seems to undergo extremely um, interesting changes that change its structure. And it means that our antibodies, even though we've made them against one version of the virus, the next version comes along and you can't do that. So the idea of getting a pan-coronavirus vaccine is to try and find a region that our immune system will recognize, but that doesn't change. And there has been some success with that with other parts of the spike protein. Pro the spike protein kind of looks a bit like a mushroom. There's three of them. There's a stem and there's a blob. Um, and that's why coronaviruses are called coronaviruses. It looks a bit like a crown down an electron microscope. Um, that stem part of the spike protein is less variable. So that's one really important target that, that, that strategies like this are looking at because the virus can't tolerate the changes to do that because that, that bit of the protein has got a really important job to do. So that's the idea. It's, it's about targeting areas of the virus that cannot tolerate the changes that the bits that we're, we're targeting at the moment do. Thanks, Steve. So that's the molecular approach to this, but there's actually a different approach to this as well in terms of tackling variants. And I think uh, Professor Trisha Greenhouse, you've got something to say about this, haven't you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to talk about variant proof masks, which already exist. Uh, the vaccine, of course, you have to develop a new vaccine, uh, perhaps every time the virus mutates. Uh, and it's a fickle beast. It keeps mutating. We've got Omicron soup right now. But just to point out that, that those masks, particularly the high quality, we call the FFP2 or FFP3 or N95 masks, the respirator masks, they will filter out any of these coronaviruses. So keep wearing your mask. Uh, that's not instead of your vaccine, but don't forget the mask is variant agnostic. Useful reminder for all of us there. Um, thank you, Paramjit, for your, for your question. Oh, uh, sorry, there is, um, there's one more hand up. Sorry, Professor Susan Mickey, did you want to add something? I, I did, uh, just about masks. Um, for people who find they're really uncomfortable to wear because they get hot and stuffy in hot and stuffy places, um, colleagues drew to my attention a couple of months ago um, masks that have a little personal electric air filter actually built into it with the little battery so you can recharge it. And what that does is bring in fresh, cool air from outside, uh, filter it, and so all the air coming into your face area is cool and, and filtered. And I had to travel um, to, I think it's four different countries over several weeks over, over the summer and um, haven't had COVID yet and really don't want to get it and was really worried about how I'd be able to get through it on plane journeys in large stuffy meeting rooms, et cetera, uh, with, with masks and found it made a fantastic difference. So I just wanted to share that that um, people who are struggling with the um, high grade mask, they're fine for a lot of the time, but in certain circumstances, these other personally filtrated ones are, are really excellent. And what's the brand, Susan? Is there a name for them? Oh, sorry. I can't remember what it is, but I think if, if people um, search online for personal filtration masks, okay. they, they will find them. I'll right. find it and I'll I'll announce it. You see me running off to get mine and then I'll come back in two minutes. We don't really want to promote particular brands. It's true, we um. don't. Yeah, maybe we don't, but uh, I'll, I've tweeted it before. Uh, but actually, if you simply put in mask with personal HEPA filter uh, into Google, then, then you'll find it. And they are, they are great. I was stuck on a stuffy plane yesterday and I was wearing mine and I was reasonably comfortable. 
Well, I'm going to move us on from masks back to the actually Paranjit's question, which is about actually vaccines. Now, uh, Sheena, did you have something to tell us about the, the development of nasal vaccines here that might be relevant? Yes, yeah, so this is the, the other kind of aspect that's trying to find something that's a bit more long term. So this, this looks at the idea that what, what can happen when you have an infection growing in a tissue. So, for example, SARS-CoV-2 kind of like likes living in our lungs and um, you can get tissue resident immunity. And that's quite long lived. But the disadvantage of being in the lungs is the virus is going to go all the way to the lungs before it's going to meet that. And so people have been developing nasal vaccines. So the idea is now that you're going to get all those kind of special long lived protectors in your nose and the very upper respiratory tracts so around your throat area. And of course, that's where the virus comes in. And um, one of the tools that they also do is they make a particular type of antibody called IgA, immunoglobulin A, and that coats those linings as well. So basically it's acting as sort of bodyguards that are trying to stop the virus getting in in the first place. And we've got other nasal vaccines and other oral vaccines, which is the same sort of principle. And they work really, really well. And they can have sterilizing immunity, which means they can prevent infection. So these are available. And I think these could also be very promising. Super interesting. Thank you, Sheena. Um, and uh, yeah, very exciting to think about that. So I'm going to move us on to the next question. And this is a question from Leah Betty, who's not here to join us. But she asks, so many articles have now looked at the effects of mild COVID infections on heart, vessels, lungs, brain, and the risk of diabetes, but the results seem to vary quite a bit. Is there now more of a consensus on whether the risks of organ and systemic damage sit closer to the higher estimates or the lower, and whether the effects are only temporary or whether the damage actually remains for life, and whether they add up after each reinfection? That's a, I'm sure, a question that lots of us have been asking, especially if you've had multiple infections like I have. Um, who would like to take this one? Okay, Sheena, do you want to go for it? We are seeing increasing evidence that um, COVID can have really serious impacts on the cardiovascular system. So the 12 month risk so far of incidental cardiovascular diseases is much higher in COVID-19 survivors than non-COVID-19 controls. And we've seen, for example, studies that have looked at MRI scans showing previous well people with, who've had mild initial COVID seem to have some kind of lingering cardiac symptoms that could be sort of cardiac inflammation. So there are quite a few studies that have emerged whether or not that's going to be lifelong risk. We can't stay with the pandemic's been with us for three years, but it shows that it can be serious. And so it is an infection that we should be trying to avoid or at least reduce the seriousness of the infection by vaccination. Thank you. Professor Christina Pagel, do you have something to add to this? Yeah, so in terms of how long it lasts, I mean, we just haven't, COVID hasn't been around long enough to say that yet. Um, a lot of the papers that have come out looking at a year, maybe 18 months max, and that's from infections in the first year. So, so the next few years are going to be absolutely crucial to looking at whether things resolve or not. Um, there is a paper looking at reinfection, um, and what that shows is perhaps unsurprisingly, that it's better not to get reinfected than it is to get reinfected. That every new infection adds risk. It's not necessary. It doesn't say really whether it's worse or, or better than the first infection, but certainly it's better than not getting a reinfection. So it is kind of cumulative in that sense. Yes, and all the more reason to make sure that we actually prevent transmission and don't get the infection again. Um, Steve, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just just on this point, just to um, bring things back a little bit to our myths. So one of the major um, myths around vaccines is that they're all just going to give us um, horrible heart inflammation, and pericarditis, uh, so myocarditis. And, and there is a slightly increased risk for adolescent males in, in particular. OK, we know about that. It's generally very, very mild. But one thing that really does give you myocarditis um, quite severely and at quite heightened risk compared with the vaccines is COVID. 
And this all feeds into this idea that, that the virus doesn't just go in our lungs. It has a receptor that's in lots of different places in our body. So that's where it gets to. And that's why it's causing all these additional problems. That's why we're looking at all these associations with other health conditions. And it's really something that, that tells us that we don't understand this virus fully. So it's another reason why this thing is not just a cold. And Professor Anthony Castello. Just, just to say there's one paper that I read recently, it was in the last month, and I need to dig out the reference, but it was a very big study following up mild cases of COVID. And they showed that there was 27 times the risk in the first month after a um, co mild COVID infection compared to control group uh, of cardiovascular complications. And that risk of fallen, but was still present after 12 months, it come down to about a, I think it was about 16 or 20% risk still higher than the controls. So it does fall over time, but it's, this is, you know, how COVID does its damage. It's, it's a cardiovascular uh, thing. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of, and people I know quite well um, have had heart attacks and, uh, and others have had strokes and stuff. So, this is a very serious issue, and um, that's why we need to control it more effectively. Thank you. That's a, yeah, a very important summary, again, of all of the multi-system uh, systemic effects of COVID. I'm going to move us on to Tim Latham's question, which is, can you address hybrid immunity? It's being discussed as being beneficial, but doesn't it continue to put people at risk? This is a really interesting question, um, and I wonder if any of our panel can speak to it, this idea of hybrid immunity. Okay, Dr. Steve Griffin, go for it. Well, <laughs> there are multiple issues around this, okay? Because yes, it's true, because our vaccines are all based on the original strain. If you then get infected with the newer strain and you become a mountain immune response to that, then you improve the diversity of your immune response. But it's more complicated than that because the, the path you tread in your immune system is affected by what's come before. Okay, it's something called immune imprinting and Danny's not here yet today, so it's a shame we can't hear even that. But as well, what you have to remember is that the, the, the question is absolutely right. There's always an increased inherent risk with infection compared to vaccination. Now, we don't have sterilizing immunity from our vaccines, so we are at risk of being infected after vaccinations. It is true that if you've survived your infection, then having a vaccine top up is also beneficial. So yes, hybrid immunity is great. We're trying to achieve that with modified boosters now. We're always gonna be behind this virus, which again is another reason why we need to suppress cases so that we can catch up. Because then if we do get our immunity and the virulence of this virus more in balance, we may one day actually be able to live with it as a cold, just not yet. Professor Sheena Crookshank, did you want to come in or you feel like that's been addressed? I think Steve's addressed it. Yeah, good job. <laughs> I'm going to move us on then uh, to a question from Nizreen Bouya. Now she asks, do we need a booster, the fourth jab, if we initially had two and then the booster? So the, the two initial vaccines and then the booster. As people are getting infected shortly after taking the fourth. Is there any evidence from the UK hospital data or scientific papers that boosters reduce severe illness, hospitalization, and death? Now, I feel we might have covered this in some of our myths, um, but is there someone who can just give a short, succinct response to that answer so that we are under no illusions? Sheena, you might as well go for it. <laughs> Well, we, we've got, we've done, quite, there's been quite a few studies that have basically shown that unfortunately, the level of protective antibodies that we need to try and, and sort of protect us from the infection, they drop quite quickly. So the boosters are needed to top that up. And the bivalent has the advantage is because as Steve's just beautifully explained, it gives us a little bit of the Omicron as well. So that might give us a little bit of a broader protection because what we do know is the kind of breadth of protection. So the more bits that your immune system can see, those specific cells can see, seems to be better in terms of, of your immunity. But no, the immunity is not long lasting enough, unfortunately, from the vaccine. So yes, we do need boosters. 
Fabulous. Look, I'm going to have to call it for today because that is all we have time for. Firstly, thanks to all the members of the public for their constant support. Thank you for joining us and for sending your questions. We really do appreciate all of the messages and the encouragement that we received from you, and we're incredibly grateful for that. Thank you, of course, to the panel members today for another brilliant session and for dismantling those COVID myths. We will be back next week, same time, same place. And please, until then, keep safe. Goodbye. Bye.